the topics that I want to talk about is like putting in the work, returning to the first love. And it's a, it's kind of long and drawn out, but what time period should we be focused on? And this, this starts about in recent debates, since I embraced the YouTube or sold out, however you want to look at that, right? <laughs> uh, the videos are now, instead of getting 100 hits, some of them are getting 700 hits. And they're getting comments and debates. And the chasm, the chasm between me and them is so far that I, I'm like, how did this happen? And and it's um the phenomenon that I'm seeing is is that people have memorized medieval doctrines, right? The Reformation, the Calvinism, the Lutheranism, and that's where they are. Yeah. They're stuck. And and but they think it's the Bible. They think it's they think that's it. They think that's where, where, where it's supposed to be. And so they're pretty far off course, but how do you get from here to there? And so that's what prompted me to think about how did I get here? <laughs> well, yeah, back in the day, there was it, there was usually you would talk to people who, who came in the building or who found you, and they would have gone through about a four-year period. It's usually it's between three and five years where something happens that they were believed they either believed in a denominational Christianity or nothing. And then but if, even if you believe nothing in the United States, you still believe in Sunday, Christmas, Easter and the Trinity, even if you've never been in church. Right. Right. So so they would then find somewhere along the way they would find something they're studying, whether it's the Sabbath or something would trigger them to look deep and then you'd find out that there's that 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 something's wrong and and you go through this period of time of study where you're it's different for each person then you come out the other side and then you you would come and find an, a, an assembly right and that that happened when we were at the bank pretty often pretty often people would come in and be like I can't believe there's somebody out there that believes like us. I can't believe somebody else has figured this out. And they and they're not done. You're not done after these three, three or four years, but you've you've crossed enough bridges to know that the traditional systems are flawed. And so when I got into this, I um I'll skip the the mushy, you know, testimonial stuff. But just to pick it up to where I, I was convinced that I had to study stuff. And you know that that room in our house, for those who've been over there with the fireplace in it, uh, that didn't the house didn't come with that. That room was just concrete and Pink Panther stuffing when we got the house. It was completely unfinished. And um, it just had uh, plastic over the framing to keep the insulation from falling out. And it was a, a completely unfinished room. And I had a desk down there. Um, that's where I where I set up shop because I've always been a traveling employee. That room's right off the garage, so I'd come home. And that's where my desk was, and it was cold. We had a we had a dog, a white dog back then, a mutt, and she she would live down there, and and um, this is about two thousand two, two thousand three, and I would sit down there for days studying stuff, and this is primitive internet days. Okay, we didn't have streaming video. We didn't even have streaming audio. And because we were in the country, we either had dial up or I had this giant satellite dish on my house that got me to like twice the speed of dial up. It was it was really bad. And so I was using real books and I was physically getting up and going to the library. I was ordering books online, not from Amazon. It didn't exist. Right. I was ordering books from websites of people who wrote books. Right. And and uh and writing things called checks. Right. This is this is whew, so long ago. 20 years ago, right? Not that long ago, but boy, is it different. And 
And so I was using dial up internet. So think about for we can't, I can't barely imagine it. I can, again, I saw it. We didn't even have pictures on websites because they would load like dunk, dunk, dunk. So you had to actually read information. Okay. And, and so I was focused on trying to prove Sunday, Christmas, Easter. I didn't, Trinity was years later when I even thought about that, one, right? Sunday, Christmas, Easter, and how Christianity was true. I was desperate to find truth in it. Not really to prove my wife wrong, but to, but I didn't want mankind to be wrong. I didn't want my ancestors to be wrong. I didn't want my family to be wrong. And and there's a thing, and as you know, you went to CTU like me, right? A uh, uh, logical fallacy called ad populum, right? Just because a lot of people believe something doesn't make it true. But when 99% of people believe something, it's probably true, right? And um, and now we're today, of course, with the way the internet works today, we're convinced that everybody's wrong, right? Because because it just something changes and and you'll see people flip on a dime like they have no principles but but so so I was down there studying the pillars of of mainstream Christianity and not just there I would take the books with me on the road uh, another thing I put in here later was that uh there's stuff that we take for granted today that we didn't have back then I spent $150 to get the bible on audio cd I bought I have to this day I still have the NASB on on CDs a giant case of CDs right that <laughs> it's on Diana's phone <laughs> uh so if you put your if you if she puts her iPhone on shuffle every once in a while it's this guy with a deep voice Leviticus 11 <laughs> it just takes off right because when because it was in our iTunes once iTunes came out, I, oh, I can put this on the phone now. I could listen to it on planes. But I used to drive around the Midwest and listen to the NASB Bible. I could only do one disc at a time because it would put me to sleep. But then I'd pull over and take notes, right? And so there was a lot of work involved in finding out this information. And, you know, I got down to the point of, of St. Saint, Saint Dionysius. I was trying to disprove or prove a legend of St. Dionysius. Who even cares about this, right? And that's when it hit me that, okay, buddy, you're going to have to cry, uncle, and realize that everything that you hold dear, that your family holds dear, that everybody holds dear, isn't true. And you have to make a change. Okay? But this was with like I say, actual books, trips to the library, taking pictures of pages, or actually it wasn't a picture. Was it a literal photocopier, right? I guess phones had cameras back then, but it wasn't as good, right? Because there's one where, because uh, we were SDA, right? So we, we did accept the Sabbath, and I got baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist church. But then I'm still studying and still learning because they're a denomination they're a Christian denomination with a lot of mainstream Christianity in them, but they don't think they have it. And so I was like, well, why are these guys not doing the feast days? Another religion. Yeah. Another religion. Okay. So I so I like, why are these guys not doing the feast days? So I go at the and they are there, that's a group of people who are great. There's more Sabbath keepers in the Seventh-day Adventist church than there are Jews in the world. Right. So they they have hospitals. There's no disrespect, right? But they are a very anti-Catholic, and they have a catechism. They actually have an encyclopedia of their beliefs, just like the Catholics have a catechism. Almost everything that those guys rail against, they do, right? And so I went and I got it, and uh, it was, and it said that they didn't, we didn't have to follow the Torah or the law because the Jews rejected Christ. And I, I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that that was even in writing. So that's what I had to take a picture of, right? That wasn't from a library. That was from my friend's library. 
my friend, my friend had that, uh, Bill Riley had that on his, on his thing. And I'm like, that's not even true. Right. Right. Just from reading the Bible, did the Jews reject Christ? Yeah. A couple of them. But then we turn the page and thousands of them are coming to the truth. They were only in the synagogues for like 10 or 15 years after the ascension. So I was like, this is astonishing information. And, um, and when it flipped and I realized I was wrong, I then had to go off and find out how could this happen, right? Now I'm, I went from, this can't be true, so now it's true, and I'm sad, to how did this happen, and I'm mad. I'm upset, okay? And so I became obsessed with finding out how did this happen? And it didn't come through videos or sermons of people. And I think that's the problem today is the difference between now and then is that back then, if you wanted to hear a sermon, they either had to be on television, on the radio, or you had to go in person. You could sign up for tracts. The Churches of God would have mailers of DVD or CDs rather, and tape cassettes. You could, you could get something to listen to at home, but nothing like today. Today, everything is online. And I'm also thinking about the the transformative years, right? Because when I found out the truth about the Sabbath, I want to tell everybody about the Sabbath. When I find out the truth about Christmas, I want to tell everybody the truth about Christmas. But at that moment, do I have, am I mature in the faith? No, I am not mature in the faith. I'm not well-rounded at that moment in time. So that I think is what's happening now is that people are coming to the, not to a truth. And when you come to a truth, you still have baggage from where you came. And so they're, so you're in this transition period, and it's easy to get up and start teaching people wrong. So the the website, firstcenturychristianity.net, um, has been rewritten a couple times. And I've looked at old sermons and went, hmm, right? <laughs> right? I did that. I said that, right? And so we we change and we grow over time. And I think today it's so easy to get on there, to get on and, pro and publish and, and, you know, gain a following. Uh, because when we were at um, at the We Woke of Sukkot, there were a ton of Pentecostal messianics at the last year that we were there. These people are still Pentecostal. They're still throwing their hands in the air like they just don't care, and they're still uh, they're still Pentecostals, but just with some Jewish words in there and doing it on the right days. And I think that might be one of the problems that we have in the movement today is that is that people are jumping into the limelight before they're ready for prime time and i had to I, before i started you know speaking or anything i had to go through a group of elders at church of god that had to that i had to you know talk in front of them and you know they could have benched me you know what i mean and when I said stuff wrong, people said, hey, you said something wrong and corrected, right? But if you're just at home learning and blah, right? Yeah. There's no accountability. There's no iron sharpening iron. There's just one direction, right? So, so some people have some truth and, you know, it's a little different today. But when I was super, super passionate and making big changes, if I could have made, well, I was, I, even when videos became big, which was back when we were at the bank, I am so old fashioned, I guess, that I'm like, no, 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 I'm not worthy of that. I know I'm not good enough to be on camera. Right. We did audio. Yeah, we could do audio. That's good. I, I always treated video like getting on Walter Cronkite or Dan Rather or 60 Minutes. Like it was something that, you know, prestigious. And, you know, and and so and I, it, it kind of, you know, 
probably missed the boat on that because some people who jumped on that early are making a whole living out of it. You know what I mean? But, but I've always had in my brain, there's James three of uh, one through five, be not many teachers for we will receive the greater condemnation. Right. And that I've always had that kind of self-restraint, not really self-doubt, but just want to make darn sure if I'm going to put something out there, that there's some meat on that bone. And, and the ability to teach people wrong is, is so potent. It's so powerful. It's so, and, and that's what we're going to get into in, into a little bit here, um, because that's what happened with the Nicene Council. You had a lot of people, a lot of people went to the Council of Nicaea from North Africa, um, Europe. Middle East, it was a huge conclave, and and they set in motion some truth, lots of faults, and we're still dealing with those faults today, right? So when you have people put forth doctrines or dogmas, um, the the people listening, not not this group, right? This group of like I said something wrong at. Uh, Tavern at Tabernacles this year, immediately. Right? He said Noah instead of Moses. Right? It was like a trap door open. Right? This group is this, and this group is cool with because when you are open, you openly communicate, you're gonna make mistakes. Everybody's gonna make mistakes, so it's not like the end of the world. But there's a lot of people out there who will look at ministers, especially if you're coming out of the Sunday system where the minister is somebody super duper special. And whatever he says is true, and you're just going to go home and repeat it and run with it. And so there's a, a very big danger in teaching people falsely. So during the walk, I did use the internet. And it was old school internet. We even had to use HTML code if we wanted to italicize a word. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is a this forum that this is way before Facebook. Um Internet forums were a thing, and this one predates even the VBB uh, bulletin boards, virtual bulletin boards, right? So this one was, and I was I was on there for secular stuff, and they had a religious section. So I looked into it, and there were legitimate ministers and clergy people duking it out in debates all day long, and these people were to be respected. Right, real military chaplain, real Catholic priest, real Eastern Orthodox ministers, real pastors, talking to very knowledgeable lay people, and they would debate subjects for days, even weeks. Threads would go and go and go, and I was involved in it because I was learning the truth. And I'm like, look at how fun this is, right? And so, but when these guys would tell me something, I wouldn't just reject it because of who they were. Right. You don't just say, OK, well, he's a, a Methodist. So we know what those Methodists believe. No, we just take them seriously, because I don't believe that people get into ministry flippantly. I think it is a calling and being wrong is not a sin. Right. Being just being mistaken is not a sin. Knowing you're wrong and teaching wrong, that's a sin. Right. Because some people are blinded. Right, and Yahweh, even the apostles after the ascension still didn't have a full grasp because they they had to be drug kicking and screaming to letting the Gentiles in, right? So they did. So so there's so Yahweh lets us learn stuff over time, and He keeps people in some places for whatever reason. He does what He does. So when these people are throwing doctrines at me, I am taking them seriously. And I'm researching it and I'm giving them respect and not saying, okay, well, you know, well, you just don't understand that. I'm mean, more of a, and I'm sure, I'm sure it's not all roses, right? It's internet debate, anonymous internet debate, anonymous internet debate. People say things, all kinds of mean stuff, right? And so you, so you start watching these debates play out and seeing who's winning, right? Because the people winning the debates, were churches of God and messianics. 
They were driving these people, they were driving the debate about whatever topic it was, right to the Bible, right to the first century, and saying, okay, you're saying this here is true, right? Let's use the rapture for an example, right? The rapture doctrine does not exist before the late 1800s. We know exactly where this came from, okay? The, the doctrine that people are going to get whisked away before anything bad happens. But uh, the Bible says that those of us, who we who are alive at the return will be, you know, the Lord will return with a shout, with the sound of a trumpet, the dead and Messiah will rise first, and we who are alive will rise to meet him in the air. It literally says that believers will be there when the Messiah returns, which means the believers will go straight through the, the Great Tribulation. And the people who didn't believe that, who wanted to believe in the rapture, would use that verse to say the rapture was true. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you talking about? We who are a book of Revelation is very clear that believers go through the tribulation, right? Very, it's not even like a thought that it's not. All of the apostles went through tribulation before they died. Uh, uh, one of the Roman emperors lit streets with the bodies of, of Christians, put them on posts, soaked them in tar, put them on posts, and set them on fire as, as nightlights. I mean, tribulation is terrible. It's a real thing. And so, so we go through these topics, and you would see people arguing the old school, medieval, you know, Protestantism, and the Catholics arguing, and then they're going back and forth. And then you'd see somebody come in that was from Church of God or Messianic. And the Messianics didn't get a lot of tractions because I myself did not understand what they were writing. It was years later before I understood any of this Hebrew stuff. And these guys keep every other word's Hebrew. We're like, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? Right? <laughs> right? But the Church of God people were, were winning these debates. And it wasn't even close. And so that, that's something to where, and, and this faith, by the way, was uh, founded on that. In the 1850s, uh, there were debates of a guy named Dugard, I think, uh, Church of God founders, uh, would go around and debate the Sabbath in Midwestern towns. They would have a town square, and they would say Sunday or Sabbath, and they would have public debates about it. And they, that's how churches started in the Midwest when the Church of God and the uh, Church of God Seventh Day and the Seventh Day Adventist churches started when they switched to the Sabbath. They had they had public debates about the Bible and the Sabbath, and the people who believed the the Sabbath switched and started congregations. But but to get into this. Um, these debates, I had read the New Testament in the NIV and then the entire Bible in uh, MKJV, Modern King James. I don't, I've never seen another one. It was at our house, that black Bible. And I'm like, okay, I need to read a whole one. And I just grabbed it at random. So I could tell in general what was true and what was false, right? I had an outline. Right. And, and, you know, probably 80 percent there. And one thing that really, really struck me is the people who think Christianity is a new religion. That somehow at, at either at the cross, Acts 10, Acts 15, they think there's some point where the Old Testament was was literally became old for reference only. And there was a New Testament church that started. And it was a new religion, and, and I've I knew from reading the Bible that it was one story, right? And it's basically one requirement, right? There's one requirement: believe God, just believe Him, right? When He says keep the Sabbath day holy, you just believe Him. If He says that. You have to be baptized in order to be saved? Okay, right? Makes life really easy, right? So that so if you go from the from Genesis to Malachi, and then you think there's a huge pivot 
you don't have a foundation. And so these people who were who who were teaching that, and that's what's showing up in our comments on YouTube now, is like, how do you how do you bridge that gap? How do you explain to somebody that you're that far off? Right? You're you're believing that a brand new religion started at Christianity. Well, the problem with that is that we don't have any instructions. We don't have any thou shouts, right? If a new religion started after the Messiah ascended, then we would have a basically Torah part two. We would have to have a set of beliefs put by some apostle that said, you know, God is one, no idolatry, no whatever. In order to come up with that, these people will go and hunt through the New Testament for what's required and what's not required. And you're kind of doing this piecemeal thing. And something they say is the Sabbath is not repeated. The Sabbath's commandment is not repeated in the New Testament, even though it is in the book of Hebrews. It says, therefore, there remains a Sabbath for the people of, for the people of God, right? Even though it's there, they'll say it's not because it doesn't say Sabbath. The King James people put, changed it to rest. Of course they did, right? <laughs> right? And so they'll say that there's, there's and I'm just like, no, that's not true. And so there's this other group of people who are who have a foundation of Genesis to Revelation, who are commandment keeping Christians, and they're answering questions, and it makes sense to me. Right now, is that Holy Spirit, or is that simply because it makes sense? Either way, I think we're good to go. Right, <laughs> right, because that's kind of why we're all here today. Um. No, but nobody could justify the Sabbath from Scripture. There were some people who would say that Paul took up a collection on the first day of the week, so that means they were meeting on the first day of the week. I'm sure they met on the third day of the week too, right? That doesn't. They're looking at it from twentieth twentieth century eyes, not twenty first century eyes, right? Twentieth century was 1900s, where the world shut down on Sunday. Right? So everybody met on Sunday. We watched a movie last night that was from the 90s, and it showed the whole town going to church on Sunday, and it showed church on Sunday, and it wasn't a normal thing. That's not anymore. Right? That 21st century doesn't have any kind of holiness. It doesn't, right? What do we hold most holy today? Football games, right? That's it. <laughs> we don't we don't do any of you know, holy holy. So they're they're looking at it from 20th century eyes saying, well, if everybody got together, that had to be Sunday because that's what I've done my whole life. But Paul got together on the first day of the week and told people to take up a collection. That's true. What did he do with that money? What did he go ahead? No, he took it to the temple. There was a famine in Jerusalem and he took the money and the food to Jerusalem and he dropped it off at the temple because he was still keeping the Torah. And he's traveling. Mm -hmm. And he just happened to be there on the first day. Yeah, and it's entirely possible that what he was telling, in one instance, that he wasn't telling them on the first day of the week, but he was saying on the first of the weeks, meaning uh, after you bring in your harvest annually, set aside crops to go to Jerusalem, because he took crops, not just money, to the temple. So it could be a sabaton, sabaton, I think is the word, so it could be the, on the first of the weeks. Which we know, only only the people listening here know first of the weeks. We know exactly when that is. It's the day Yeshua was resurrected, and it is a Sunday, right? And that, that and go ahead, Ross. Go ahead. Oh, what kind of what kind of crops would they have taken? Would they have did, taken grain? Yeah. Yeah, it would have been grain. They wouldn't have been produce necessary. It would have been grain, like yeah, wheat, it, barley. I, okay. That's no, well, that's. Okay, okay. I said, yeah, like as if I was there and knew it, right? But <laughs> but that's generally what is hauled. It could have been corn. It could have been wheat. It could have been barley. Probably not grapes and things that would rot uh, because they would be at sea for a long time. Yep. I guess we're good. All right. Next, I see you've changed. You've changed your background, sir. You are now in the valley. 
in a meadow with crops and mountains. Oh, uh, that's weeds. That's uh, eastern uh, Sierras, Owens Valley. Oh, cool. You've been, you live in California, you know where Bishop and Lone Pine is? I do know where Bishop, California yeah. is. Yes. <laughs> that's Owens River, and that's the Sierra Nevadas in the background. Nice. Beautiful. I do miss those mountains. Probably taking them in the winter. Yeah. Well, they probably are pure white right now with all the snow. It's probably no no ground showing at all, huh? Well, yeah. <laughs> no. So the um the next topic was Christmas. Christmas is a joke. Okay. It's not in the Bible at all. But if you've done it your whole life. And your whole family's done it. And it is the unifying thing in the country and in the church. It's hard to give it up. But they were debating if Christmas time comes around and the Messianics were calling everybody pagan and the Church of God were too. And I'm like, well, well let's look into this, right? Which I, I did find books in the Encyclopedia Britannica and Catholic Catechism. Uh, AmericanCatholic.org.com, uh, which is a website that existed back then with a lot of articles where they were open about the stuff that they made. And they say, yes, the, we made Sunday, and the entire world bows down to our authority every week. We made Christmas, and the entire world bows down to our authority every year. Right. We made East. They're wide open about it. And that's why getting these legitimate sources, not just listening to a guy who's streaming. Got to be there. Got to do it now. Right. Because otherwise, no, but there's no counter argument out there if we don't use the tools. But but um, the, they're wide. The, there's a paper trail of all of these changes. And there's these councils, Council of Nicaea, Council of Laodicea, Council of Chalcedon. They got together and made doctrine, doing exactly what the Messiah said not to do, right? You teach for doctrines the precepts of men. We have precepts of men. They even call them the early church fathers. And even the Protestants still give those guys credence. And so I'm looking at it like, well, wait a minute. We know where this came from. What did the actual apostles do? What? Did, how did they commemorate Yeshua? What did they do in the winter? If anything, they were lighting a menorah in the winter. If they did anything at all, right? That one's pretty much, that's not a commanded feast in Hanukkah, right? But we know that Paul taught the Corinthians to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread which means he taught them to keep the Passover outside the land uh, and after the Messiah ascended. So we can totally hang our hat on that all day long, right? If we're doing that, we're doing what the first century church did. If you're not doing that, you're not doing what the first century church did. Things started to get a little black and white, a little easy to sort, a little, what should I be doing? What shouldn't I be doing? Because if you guys don't recall if you haven't heard before, there was a couple of years where we didn't do anything. We did nothing but the Ten Commandments. And so we were like, uh, and then the, the feast days came in later. So we got to like a Puritan type place because I, not everything was pagan. Even, the, even our watches are pagan. They have Roman numerals on them and they're oriented in a sundial for people who worship the sun. Everything's pagan, right? So you have to get to a mature part of the faith to realize that you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And you're not going to observe pagan holidays, but what are we supposed to be doing? Well, there was the Church of God and the Messianic people teaching what you were supposed to do. Easter is a little bit harder. Easter is a little harder to tell the difference on because of its proximity to Passover most years. And, and it, because of its proximity to Passover, um, it's easy to get to, to not catch that one, right? But then you start digging into it, and they are all um, going on Resurrection Sunday to, to have sunrise services to worship the risen Messiah. And then you read the Bible, 
and you realize that the women went to the tomb before the sun rose and it was already empty. Well, what are they doing? What, where does it say we're supposed to keep that, that day to commemorate the Messiah? Now, is it bad to commemorate this Messiah on the Sunday that he rose from the dead? Probably not. Turns out, Yahweh gave us a holy day for that called First Fruits, right? He gave us a commanded uh, observance, not a festival. It's not a festival day, but kind of, right? He gave us a day to do that on an annual basis. But to use that to justify Easter or to justify Sunday every week, it's not there. And so these guys are very educated, and they're very much arguing, and they're very much citing references that I am very much going and reading, because I respected them. And today, when people comment and say, well, what are you, well, you know, what are you arguing about? And I'm like, their comment shows that they didn't even listen to the message. They didn't even read the PDF. I mean, how easy can I make it for you, <laughs> right? They're just commenting on the title. Because I, the title of my message is contrary to what their church teaches, so I must be wrong. And I'm like, well, then why are you? Why would you even go to the? It's not like I'm. It's not like I'm cruising um, Mormon websites or I'm in Catholic forums posting this stuff. This is just on a YouTube channel. Why would you be on that channel commenting if you weren't going to consume the information first? And that's kind of the point I'm getting at, is, is, is that in these debates, and these people are throwing doctrines at me, who are legitimate people who have read the Bible and read the histories and have a perspective, why would I not take them seriously, right? It doesn't mean I'm worshiping them, right? It means that they are legitimate people who've gone through colleges and whatnot. And so you, you if you engage, at least have the basic decency to to listen to what the other person says. It's not going to kill you to hear bad doctrine, right? It's not, it's not unless you accept it, right? But just it, just the engagement is the uh, is the thing. And then this is people not keeping the commandments. Now, this was you know well before I would use the word Torah, maybe 10 years before I would even use the word Torah. But it's plain as day that Yahweh didn't write that stuff in stone so that we could change it, right? He wrote the command, the Ten Commandments in stone, and there's all these people out there who teach that there's no, that there's no law, and I'm like, how does that even, how does, what are you saying it's okay to murder people? I mean, that I would ask them legitimately, are you saying it's okay for us to worship idols? Are you saying it's okay for us to commit adultery, Right? Because when you say the law is, is done, that's what you're saying. And they so they don't really believe it, but they're saying it. They're repeating things that have been taught to them over and over and over again, but that they would never do in practice. It's not like these people are getting out of church on Sunday and going over to the convenience store and shoplifting because they don't think that stealing is wrong. They know stealing is wrong. They know murder is wrong. They know theft is wrong. They know they just don't want to have to change i guess but Especially it's the moral law they have. yes they say the moral law right which is offensive this is offensive term saying that it is not a moral imperative to keep the sabbath it is right you always it's, it's a moral that's a moral law right that's not a secular law but they kind of try to treat it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the uh, two epiphanies this week were, you know, videos of people not being mature before becoming popular and not putting in the work, right? Because that's where we do today is everything's online. Even Hislop, even the two Babylons is in PDF for free on the computer now, right? So it's so easy to get that PDF up and just control F and look for the part you want and move on, right? Same with Josephus. Very easy to just go PDF it and move on. And I came up when it, when in order to have that information, you had to have a book, an actual book, 
that I carried with me on airplanes with notes and wrote in it, right? And this is, and I sound so old fogey, right? But let me tell you a secret. I'm not that old fogey. Guess when I was making this this week, guess how I did? I texted myself notes through voice chat. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I send myself messages. And back in the day, I used to send myself emails. I would reply all to an email. And then at the end of it, I would have a, a list of things that I had struck me during the week. And so, so it's not bad to use technology and I'm not some kind of knuckle dragger. In fact, quite the opposite. I can make networks and format computers. I'm pretty savvy with the internet, but there's a point where it doesn't make sense. Or there's a point where you have to actually sit down and focus. You know, lately I've been sitting down every morning and reading a chapter or two from the New Testament with no phones around me, upstairs, printed Bible. It's a different experience. I see it in my head. You know, when it says that Paul sailed to, what's the one that starts with an E? Uh, Ephesus, yeah, he, I was going to say Epiphanius, right? As we sailed to Ephesus, I'm seeing him get on a ship in my head, and I'm, I'm a much more robust, rich way of, of doing it without all the distractions, just reading it off of a page and using your imagination, rather than when I make these things, I'm copying and pasting verses from Esword into Word, right? And it's, it's much more of a technical type thing. But actually reading, and we were reading, uh, for those of you who are far off, we have a study afterwards that you have to fly here to attend, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, we're, we're studying Ezekiel. And when we read Ezekiel today, you aren't, don't you guys see it in your head? Don't you see the elders coming to him and, and talking to him, right? I don't see that when I read it on the computer or the phone. When I read it on the phone, it's almost, it's, it's almost useless on the phone, right? Because it's just the same way that I'm consuming, you know, Twitter or the weather, you know? So um, the other epiphany is that people are focusing on the wrong time periods to establish their truth. So so we're going to pivot now to, to kind of a different topic. So if anybody wants to comment on how, how you came to this before we move on, right? How was your walk? similar to mine. How did you come from secular Christianity or wherever you were to learning about this? And what references did you use? Unless you're doing it now. Go ahead, Ross. Well, for me, it started probably about 15 years ago. I used to listen to a guy on short radio, Dr. Stan. It's called Radio Liberty. He's a Christian doctor. Um, there's a war in America about things that were coming. And he had a Pentecostal pastor. I uh, can't remember his name. But he's explaining the the, uh, the pre-tribulation rapture that we would be here to the end, not take off of the, before the, rap, uh, before the tribulation. Okay. And I kind of realized then, you know, something was wrong. And this is the early days of YouTube. I started checking other things. This would have been, I think YouTube started in 2005. So it might have been like 2008, 2009. They had started, somebody had uploaded uh, the History Channel and Jeremiah Ministries. I don't know if you remember them. They made uh, different documentaries. I found one on Christmas and Easter and Halloween, the origins of them, how they were pagan. And yet a lot of churches we're still celebrating those. For me, it was very, to me, close to 15 years we figured all this out. Yeah. I think it was in the fall of 2020, I read a book by uh, Stephen uh, Spikerman. I don't know if you heard of him. I haven't heard of him. He's anybody. a Messianic Jew. He lives okay. in Wales. All right. You know who he is? No, no. no. But he wrote a book, Is the Law Still? Is the Law Dead? And I read that, and I thought, He's right. The law is not dead, but it took me about 15 years to figure it out. It didn't happen three or four years for me. It took me quite a while. Yeah. All right. That's, I mean, that that's a, a case too, to be made for taking your time. But um, 
I, 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 mean, I didn't mean that if you didn't <laughs> do it in time. four years that you were that there was you were deficient by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it no, was just, I know, I know you didn't. Yeah, I know you yeah. didn't. Um, but it was, a, yeah. It's just, yeah. It was a research project. It was there were people would come into the bank and say, "Man, I've been all alone for three years." The next next week, somebody coming to the bank, "I've been all alone for four years," right? And next people, and it was just a common thread. Um, but that's good. But you you see, that's another reference tool that I use to this day, and I used back then heavily was History.com. That's a legitimate source. Like if you go to college. You, you don't want to base what you know today off of sources that you couldn't put on a college paper. Right? You know what I mean? You want to have some kind of accreditation. Of course, that was before Dan Rather forged documents to change the outcome of an election. So, so, maybe, so maybe we wouldn't want to use that anymore today. But that's good that you're using, you know, you use legitimate sources um, because you don't want to get into that my pastor said stuff because yeah people who have microphones say stuff and we're not always right anybody else yeah Harry? i can do a different twist um of course i was agnostic for years and then things happened that kind of uh, made me start believing in him but not really well then my friend had me read the whole series left behind okay and in there, it, it was preacher in, which at the time I thought, okay, that, that kind of makes sense. But then it had you in the, I think it was the first book, even in the second chapter, The Sinner's Prayer. And I'm going, I've never heard of that. So I have an N NIV Bible, and I started reading the Bible looking for The Sinner's Prayer. I'm going, is this something that's really true? Because I was raised Catholic, and then I became agnostic. And I didn't hear any of that. So I started reading the Bible. And the first time I read it through, I was specific on something. And not all of it sunk in. But then I said, I need to go back and read it again. And when I started reading it again, things started popping out at me. And I realized that pre-trib was wrong. I realized all the the, the Catholic festivals, you know, the, yes. the Christmas, the Easter, and all that was wrong. And that's what started opening my eyes. Now, I've only been on this trip about five years. Yeah. So I'm new to it, and I'm still a student. But it was something in reading the Left Behind books, literally the books, and that <laughs> talked about sinner's prayer. And that's what took me on my trip to start looking in the Bible and finding out. And then I found out lots of things that I had been told that were wrong based on the Bible. All right. Okay, so we can pivot. I don't see anybody else putting their hands up or anything. So the the other the other thing is that people who are focusing on the wrong periods of time to emulate. So we're just gonna, you know, this is kind of like Stephen's speech right before he gets martyred. It's like our fathers were under the clouds. So we start with Adam and Eve. Okay, the Seven Day Adventists, are vegetarians. Because Adam and Eve were vegetarians. Do we live before the flood? We do not live before the flood. Okay. <laughs> okay. And and so so that's that's we we see the change. However, so if your brother doesn't want to eat meat, right? I'll, I'll say about your brother not eating meat. Right. Don't don't offend people. Don't make it a stumbling block and whatever. Right. Um, but. But Paul also writes to Timothy that false prophets are people who forget who forbid you from eating food that Yahweh said are okay. Yeah, I think that's first Timothy four. One of they pressure you. Okay. But they don't, but they they don't call it a sin. They specifically don't call it a sin, but don't you bet you better not show up with a burger at potluck. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um but it's just one example, right? The, the next one is one for our people, right? In the days of Moses, right? Our movement has got to the point where we think, not us, but they think that if you got the name right, 
and we had the alphabet right, and we had the tabernacle, that boop, we'd be right up there in the kingdom, right? Spent so much time on this ancient Hebrew stuff and so into the Torah that they forget about the New Testament, and a lot of people deny the Messiah. They end up turning themselves into kind of a pseudo-ancient Jews or ancient Israelites. Um, you know, we, we have a better covenant. The book of Hebrews says that this, we have better promises. We have all the history to build upon, and even Moses, this is going to blow your mind, even Moses knew that wasn't the end of the road. Moses prophesied about Yeshua. Moses knew about the book of life. And at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, he says, when you guys mess up, you're going to get scattered. He knew. We don't know everything that he knew, but you could tell that he knew they were going to mess up. They were going to get drawn back together. He knew that there were other steps in the plan. So a lot of times um, we, we get stuck in the past. These, these Norman Rockwell glasses, right? You know, the glasses we used to have with these pure idyllic pictures of a boy and a dog and a bridge and a, right? And, and we think that the 50s were the best or we think the 60s were the best. These were all steps in a process. Every era has good and every era has bad. But our goal is not to go backwards. Our goal is to go forwards. Our goal is the return of the Messiah and the establishment of a Torah-keeping planet for a thousand years, and then the Olam Haba. So the, so the Hebrew Roots Movement it is good because we have embraced a lot of truth, right? Reading the Bible from a Hebraic perspective, that's the chasm that I'm talking about. I'm so far over here, and these folks are still regurgitating middle e middle age is, you know, sophistry. <laughs> and that that this is, I can see, I read the Bible, and to me, Paul is a, he's like a rabbi walking around teaching people about the Torah and the Messiah. He's in the synagogue. I read today, and uh, was the Acts, the book of Acts, where he was sailing from Ephesus, and he got to one of these cities, and he was in the synagogue for a year and a half preaching Yeshua. You don't get to go to the synagogue twice if you're preaching the Torah was nailed to the cross. <laughs> you don't get to do it. You don't get to stay there for a year and a half if you walk up with a ham sandwich one time and you're gone, right? You would have defiled their place. So I'm reading it now. It, it makes so much more sense. But if somebody is is founded in these other ideas it's just just like what happened with terry what happened with ross what happened to me you have to have some event holy spirit environment inspired event to get you to look and then you have to have the holy spirit to be humble enough to go i'm wrong and then you gotta move on and and that's a very difficult thing and i and and so then we move we move on to the days of David and Solomon. There's some people who think First Temple Israel was the bee's knees, and it was a great temple. But the same guy that inaugurated the temple, Solomon, brought in the idolatry. So we so so we're not going back to that. That's not where that's not the goal. We're not going when we go forward. There's going to be a point where a temple comes down from heaven and falls into, into Jerusalem and all mankind are going to go to that temple and those who don't show up aren't getting right. What do you think is going to happen with the ones who show up with idols? Not going to be good. <laughs> Not going to happen. Okay? <laughs> Hunted, right? Not going to happen, right? There's not going to be idolatry or syncretism, the blending of religions is called syncretism. That's not going to be a thing in the millennium until the end when Satan comes out and deceives the nations one more time. As we're reading the days of Ezekiel. I mean, nobody wants to live in exile, right? Guess what? We live in exile. <laughs> this is that's our reality. We are more like 
the ba- the the people who were in Babylon or the diaspora than at any other time in the Bible, because we are. We're people who've joined ourselves to Israel by accepting Yeshua as the Messiah and keeping the commandments in Babylon. Literally, we live in Babylon, spiritual Babylon, right? And so we can relate to those guys. But that's not where we're going to stay, right? We're Again, we're, we're here for a season. We're here to learn what we can learn and live as righteous as people can live in anticipation of the return of the Messiah where we go forward. The days of Nehemiah and Ezra, that was great. The days of restoration, of faithful people getting together to rebuild the city. That's a good time. Guess what? We're not waiting for a city made that was built with hands. In Yeshua's house, there are many mansions. They already exist. They weren't built by people. That's where we're going. We're looking for a restoration of the heart. We're looking for the restoration of the world, a miraculous, humongous restoration. A lot of people in the Hebrew roots want to move and make it their own private Idaho, right? They want to move out to the country, probably set up their house to be in the same shape as, as Jerusalem, right? And then, Which is cool. It's cool if you want to do that, okay? But don't think that you're commanded to do it and don't think that that's a requirement. We do live outside the country, have for over outside the city for over 20 years. Great life. Don't think it's cheap. Every piece of PVC pipe that you have to replace requires a trip to the Home Depot that's 30 minutes away. Okay. It's it's a very it's a it's a different lifestyle. And but we wouldn't trade it for the world. We don't want to live in the city. We don't want to listen to sirens. We don't want to have drive-bys. If we have drive-bys, it's people checking out our windows, right? <laughs> Right, Terry gives me the eyes because she has, she has that problem in her neighborhood. So, yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, but but don't think that that there's there's no commandment, zilch, in the New Testament. There's no evidence. There's no nothing of the people hearing the truth about Yeshua, learning the commandments, and then moving to the wilderness or moving to Jerusalem. Right. They. Didn't happen, right? Lake Lake They're at the Lake of the Ozarks. Yes, they are, or in Arkansas, right? And and but that if that I'm not I'm not judging how you want to live. I'm just saying, don't get it in your head that you have to do that, because if live on right, right, you don't you don't have to do that. All the believers, if we we, do, we already covered it, the believers are going to be in amongst everybody like Rahab the harlot. Right. And if, if you're outside the city when that happens, probably that's I don't think it's bad. Right? Time. Yeah. If you could make some popcorn or whatever. But um, but in the first century. Right. Because we had the restoration, which brought us to the first century, which is the time of the Messiah and the spreading of the gospel to the world. That's kind of where we are right now. Right. I've said it a few times in recent days. Theologically. We are still at the place where the temple came down, right? There's nothing, there's no, you know, Israel being restored in 1948 kind of is another step, right? But li- but in, in most literal terms, the it said that from the going forth of the decree to rebuild the temple until the Messiah will be such and such days, and then... Uh, Jerusalem will be laid desolate, the Daniel 9 prophecy, right? So Jerusalem was laid desolate, the gospel went forth to the world, and we're still in that period. And that's where we can actually you know, develop our faith and develop our doctrines and develop how we're going to live. When Paul or Barnabas or Silas or Timothy or Peter walked into a city and they started talking to Gentiles and they said you needed to accept Yeshua as the Messiah, those people were right where they were, kept doing their jobs, stopped worshiping idols idols like Mars and Jupiter and Apollos, and they pivoted to keeping the commandments, keeping the Sabbath, no more pork, and they changed their hearts right where they were, and then they made crowds and made congregations. And that's that's where we sit today. 
uh, the fourth century AD. Believe it or not, we don't live then. Now I'm pivoting from us to mainstream Christianity. The mainstream Christianity people. Oh, my phone was ringing. It's some spam thing. Yeah. Um, but the fourth century AD uh, is not what we're supposed to replicate. Those bishops were assembled under the power of the Roman emperor. They were not a, um, a mignon. They were not a holy, they were not assembled under the, under the terms of the Torah. They got together as councils under the authority of the, of the Roman government. And the Roman emperor had many titles. So that's how, that's how they didn't want to have a king. So they had an emperor. And so the emperor had all these different titles. And he could say, acting is this, acting is that. He took the title of Pontifex Maximus, which is a pagan religious title. And he put that on the Bishop of Rome. And made the Bishop of Rome the Pontifex Maximus, which made him the Bishop of Bishops, and he established the Roman Catholic Church. And that was done through the power of the state, not through the power of the Almighty. And so we have to take their doctrines for what they are. Now, were those people getting together in a nefarious fashion, trying to invent a false religion? Probably not. They probably weren't doing that. They were probably doing what they thought was right at the time. And there were probably a bunch of bad actors who were who were vying for political favor. And there was probably a mix of people. But when we read their documents, read them for what they are worth. They're as maybe commentary on scripture or maybe history. Because those things did happen and Yahweh let them happen. But it doesn't mean we have to do what they did. <laughs> or we, have, we don't have to follow their, their lead. Doing what's right in their own eyes, whatever they thought was right. To a, to a certain degree, yeah. But we don't know. We weren't there. Yeah. You were there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Huh. Yeah, reincarnation. Um, the dark ages, the dark ages and uh and and the pope popery, the, the Catholic times. We certainly don't want to live like that. But I come from a Roman Catholic family who are have strapped their wagon to that church. And they think that that church is the one that goes back to Peter and everything that church does or did is right. And the rest of us need to follow that church. Yeah. Yep. That's where that's 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 Catholicism. And so. That's. um, Not for me. Right. Because you can't. You, you, you can't uh you, you can't be in a church that teaches you contrary to the Bible and makes up their own holy days and do, and and does actually teaches that everything Israel was smote for is now legitimate that's impossible you know that it, Jerusalem was destroyed because of idolatry and then after the Messiah all right we'll just call them saints. We'll just put that. Everybody's a saint. Everybody's a saint. Say right. We'll put that nimbus around people's heads and do, I mean, all sorts of paganism blended in. Is that, is that replacement theology where that came from? No, replacement theology that, is whatever. <laughs> Martin Luther, not Martin Luther <laughs> King. <laughs> no. Oh, no, replacement theology is that the church replaces Israel. Uh, it's, a, it's a form of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a way of saying that in each era, there's a different set of rules, which is kind of true, okay? Because we don't have a temple today, right? So can't be expected to live by that stuff. But dispensationalism and replacement theology they basically is, is a theology that says all of the blessings of the Bible— apply to Christian believers, all of the curses apply to Israel, and then the Gentiles could go either way, okay? So it just breaks mankind up into three different sections. And a dispensation is, is about periods of time, 
So the dispensationalist would believe that when the, when Messiah returns, that Christians, you and I, all we have to do is believe. We don't even have to go to church. We don't have to do anything. We're just saved by grace alone. But the Jews who accept Yeshua in the end times will have to keep Torah and believe in Yeshua. So it's almost a mirror image of what the MJAA teach, the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, believes that you Gentiles, you can come worship with us, but you don't have to do what we do, right? So they're kind of complementing that dispensation type stuff. It's very, very difficult to get that out of the Bible, right? Paul wrote that there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, but we are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you are if you are Messiahs, then you are Abraham. Uh, Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Seems like there's one message for everybody in that, right? I'm just saying. I, uh, the dispensationalists? Yeah. They don't reject Paul. They use Paul for all their theology. Paul's the only person that they believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They are, they, they are the reason that people re reject Paul because they treat Paul as if he's the founder of a new religion. Mm -hmm. And then they don't, and then they don't see any of his references to Torah. Uh, that was one, one person wrote me uh, this week because he's, he's thinking he's was reading judgment day message. And he's like, you said in the judgment day message that there are righteous people, but Paul wrote, there are none righteous, not one. How can that be true? I said, well, you have to take what Paul said and realize that that's a quote from the book of Isaiah, and they go read the whole thing, right? Because there's a long list of people who are righteous in the Bible. Did you right? talk about that? I did, and I sent him that message, right? But yeah, but the people who are uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous. Those are the uh, parents of John the Baptist. Noah was righteous. Um, Moses. Oh, go ahead, Ross. Yeah. Uh, I was I was just reading that subject uh, leaving Babylon. Um, let's start of the book. The people that were counted righteous kept the Torah. Yeah, they kept the law. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was. Um, we even read it in Ezekiel today. In Ezekiel fourteen, I think. I think it says the same thing. You're exactly right. The people who kept the Torah are righteous. Now, now, now. Mainstream Christianity teaches there's none righteous, there's not one, meaning that if you sinned once, you're basically worthless. You're never going to be righteous right. again. You're never going to be righteous again. It's not the case, right? Surely, surely you can make it 24 hours, right? You can make it a week. You, right? <laughs> I don't know, right? But, but the ability, Yahweh, this is another fundamental change that I, that, that hit me, just reminded, is that. There is no commandment that says thou shalt not jump off a cliff and fly, right? He's not going to, he doesn't have to command you to, to do stuff that's, to not do stuff that's impossible, right? How many triple negatives can I throw in there? So, the, so, the, so what I'm saying is that if he tells you to follow the Torah, and if he tells us, you know, because if you take the list of things that a regular Israelite would do, not a Levite, not a Kohen, not a, you know, not a, a cantor or something, just a regular person, the, the following the Ten Commandments, the holy days, the uh, clean and unclean laws, that's possible. This is something Everett talks about, right? It's possible to make it through a day without breaking the laws that apply to you in Torah. And, and so that would be defined as you lived a righteous day. I mean, it doesn't mean, and it's not your own righteousness that's going to save you, but that's what's in the book of Ezekiel uh, that we're reading after this. It says David's righteousness did not, would save his family or, or uh, Noah's righteousness. They were righteous, but they were, their righteousness would only, would only cover themselves. The thing about Yeshua is his righteousness was so great that it covers the world. Right. So he's he's, you know, the ultimate, you know, everything. And so that's that's the kind of difference. But anyway, I forgot how I got on that. Um, so this re the Reformation time, and this is where most people today are stuck. They are stuck 
in a in a Calvinist mindset, a Protestantism. It used to be it used to be Protestant, Presbyterian, Lutheran, and they had different varying beliefs. But it, it seems that Calvinism is kind of taken over all of it, right? Or or some tenets of it. And so the Reformation was good in that it did get us out of Catholicism and it did give put Bibles in our hands. But it was also bad because it enshrined a bunch of teachings that were not um that were flawed into people's minds that they hold to this day. So the so the Reformation is almost like how the United States is both the place where the eagle took the woman to protect and the whore of Babylon at the same time. We're a good nation and we're a bad nation at the same exact time, right? So when people look in prophecy, they try to identify as clear as black and white. We occupy both of those positions and um, rapidly moving towards more horror than righteous, but 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 so it's it's kind of a difficult difficult thing. So there was good stuff that came from the the Reformation, but we didn't stop growing there, and that's what I want to say is that the, at the printing of the King James Bible, a flaming chariot did not come down and take people up to heaven. Okay, that wasn't the end of the story. Sixteen eleven was another step in the process. We are 500 plus years from that. No, we are not 400 plus years, right? <laughs> right, can't add. From, from, that, from that moment in time, we were not supposed to stop learning and stop growing and stop repenting and stop fixing and stop pruning. We're supposed to continually, you know, improve, right? This is Yahweh's quality plan. Um, the 1850s here was a great time of revival in the United States. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was made, and the Church of God Seventh-day was made. And the Seventh-day Baptists came to prominence. So we had a lot of good stuff. We also had some bad denominations that were founded at the same exact time. We had some silliness that was founded at the same time. It was a leap forward, though. It was a leap forward for people to return to the truth of the, at least the Ten Commandments and the idea that it's one big Bible, not uh, not uh, not separated. And so then we get to the 1930s. The 1930s, what happened then? That's when a guy named Herb decided to preach the Sabbath and the Holy Days. He added in the Holy Days as part of the recipe. And we benefit from that to this day because there are people who were in that congregation and maybe raised in it. They might have been born during that, you know, that era because that church went from the 1930s until 80 something, 1980 something. And so there's 50 years of a denomination in the United States. It's actually worldwide. That was what the W stood for. And, uh, and they, they had feast sites with 15,000 people and kids who grew up living the way we do today. That was good, but it wasn't the end of the road. Again, no flaming chariot. Even though the guy named Herb thought he was one voice of the one in the wilderness, turns out he wasn't the voice of one in the, one in the wilderness, right? But so they had to have a correction. So today we've, we've kind of come full circle because today people are getting on the videos and getting on the internet and they're learning truth, and not really getting out of Babylon, but adding in truth at the same time. Um. Uh, yeah, Herb Armstrong did teach about that topic, which he stole from somebody. Uh, the um, uh, Hebrew uh, is British Israelism, the idea that all the white people are actually Jews. Not it's not, it's not a thing, right? It's not, and it, it actually is contrary to Scripture because of what I said about Paul. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We're adopted children of Abraham. So that doctrine that he believed says we're not adopted children of Abraham, that we were all born to do this, despite a thousand years of our ancestors not doing it, right? It's, it's so so it's, it's not really a thing. And the Bible says the lost tribes, um, Isaiah, 
think it's Isaiah, who knew where they were, and it wasn't Europe. Uh, it was Assyria and Egypt. The lost tribes went the they went the other way. That's why when Peter talks about um uh the brethren in Babylon in one of Peter's letters, he, he's talking about the last tribes that he went to visit in Persia. And went the, they went the other way. So yeah, but that was a big thing in uh in the Armstrong church. And uh to the point that there was a leader in that church who was of Persian descent that he couldn't go any higher because he couldn't. He got to a certain level, and Armstrong wouldn't let him go any higher because he wasn't of the tribes. <laughs> so that's really not good, right? That's kind of, a, yeah. Anyway, um, so at any rate, you know, what do we do? What do we do today, right? We we have to keep putting one foot in front of another, right? And we have to keep the focus on that first century belief. That's why the ministries called this, right? Because that's what we could know. That's what we can quantify. That's what we can get our head around. That's what we can get our minds around. We I, we can read the book of uh, the book of Josephus is a historical book, not a biblical book, and understand how first century Judea operated. We can read Philo. Don't recommend it. Guy was kind of crazy, but we can read Philo and and we can understand what Hellenistic Jews looked like because that's what he was. He was a a, a Jew who had a lot of Greek tendencies in him. We can focus on the New Testament, focus on the histories, and recreate that faith, because that's where we theologically are until the end of days. And putting in work, uh, that's that's another thing, is, is watching YouTube videos is not research. It's informative, but you have to take notes, and you have to verify what the people say. You have to go to the Bible and say, hey, okay, look, I've been taught this my whole life, and you just said that. Chris, how did you get there? Why are you telling me that there are righteous people when my entire life I've been told there aren't righteous people? That's a Bible, con biblical contradiction, right? That's what that gentleman did. He said, wait, well, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm, all, I'm all, yep, go for it. Hit me up, right? Because I might be wrong, right? And so then... I'll explain it. And so you have to read the Bible, get a bunch of tra different translations, get Esword, and put in the work, stay sober-minded, get mature in the faith, and realize that we're not done yet. That was one of Armstrong's mistakes, is that he thought because there were so many commandment keepers in his organization, that surely the Messiah was going to come in 1973. Diana and I were born in 1973. Neither one of us are the Messiah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay so... Oh, really? Yeah. Charles was born in 73. It's a good year. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, praise Yahweh that uh, you know, if our if our parents were in the worldwide church of God, they probably wouldn't have had us because Armstrong was so convinced that 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 Yeshua was coming back in 73 that the church convinced people not to have kids. They didn't drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. But when we were in Worldwide, you'll notice that there aren't people around our age. There are people who are 60, right, today, because we're 50. There are people who are 60. There are people who are 40. Not a lot of people at 50. So it's kind of a shame. Um, but, that's a, but then again, that's the power of the tongue. Right. That's that power of the teaching is that is it he was a really dynamic speaker and the spirit was upon him because he did that. That organization did get big and it was a commandment keeping organization. But you got to be careful because people are going to take what you say uh, super serious, especially if you have that much, you know, power, you know. So so I'm going to stop talking. And see if anybody else wants to say anything before we close it out. <laughs> Terry has to take a walk. Oh, come on. So I had to push some buttons out there. <laughs> Go ahead, Everett. Yeah, um, it, it, there, there's a problem uh, not only dealing with, uh, you know, Protestants, but people in the Church of God that you sort of hinted at as well, uh, 
there are so many that are so locked into the fact that Herbert Armstrong was God's apostle and all truth came through him that they can't get beyond that at all. And uh, they won't, uh, won't give you the time of day, really. Uh, anything that uh, disagrees or, do or doesn't seem to agree with what they've been taught, their eyes kind of gloss over and uh, they, they don't know what to do. Uh, it seems to me the solution is simply to say, well, do you have that in writing? <laughs> and, and, and take the time to read it. Does it make sense or not? Yeah, there's a guy um, that you and I, you you probably knew better than I did, but uh, he hosted a Zoom room and uh, spoke on it. Uh, and I, 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 I'm not going to name the guy. You'll know, speak ill of the dead, but he, he passed out. He passed away due to COVID shortly after this. I spoke on his Zoom room, and the Book of Revelation talks about people who will never have a chance. Uh, it says those who are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who, who received the mark of the beast, are going to be destroyed. Right? That there's people who are going to live who never had a chance. And Church of God didn't like that. They had a doctrine that taught something other than that. And uh, and this guy went round and round with me. And I'm like, all I did was I read that verse for a completely different reason. It had, I wasn't talking about that doctrine or that topic at all. I, I was talking about predestination and free will. And, um, and he had actually listened to that message and requested that I give that message to his audience. And when I went to that part, the place blew up. It was ugly. The comments, and I'm just talking like I'm talking to you guys, and I watched the Zoom. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Jim O'Brien's on there from Cincinnati, the pastor of Cincinnati Church. There's all these people on there. And in subsequent afterwards, they, they, they I, I'm like, well, I wonder what I said, right? And so in the after talk, like we're in now, uh, you know, they were like, it, and it just really, that's not true that, you know, everybody's going to have a chance and this and that, the other. And I'm like, Hey guys, I didn't write, I didn't write the book. Right. So just read it. And I, and I, I didn't know. And I was like, told this guy, I'm like, you asked me to come here that this I'm using the same exact slide deck I did on the, on the one you watched. And I guess he didn't hear it or whatever, but in the, in the ensuing argument, uh, he told me if that doctrine that, that Armstrong put forth wasn't true, then he would reject the entire religion. Like he said, if this isn't true, then I don't want anything to do with it. And that, I think that was one-on-one -on -one afterwards. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> is it? I think it's, is it because you think that your loved ones will be saved? And so it's more of a taken in a personal route to say, the innocent we look at as innocent who didn't have a chance to hear the news or convert or whatever. It's more of a personal mindset. Oh, well, I mean, there was uh, the church, church, worldwide church of God had, had based, had three big doc, unique doctrines aside from the Sabbath and the Holy days. Um, one was the gap theory, this uh, resurrection uh, this this other way of reading the resurrection where everybody is going to have another lifetime, and then the British Israelism. Those were their three unique things. And so the people who are hardcore in that faith are never going to give those things up. So, I mean, it's not any different than yeah. some of the Christianity where they're not going to give Christmas up or Easter, mm -hmm. you know. So you are fixated on this idea of what's right, and you're not going to listen to anything else. I mean, it's, it a lot of religions and a lot of people's beliefs are like that. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing how the process repeats itself because as I was talking earlier about how the seventh day Adventists are very, very anti-Catholic while employing Catholic type activities. Mm -hmm. This is the identical of that the people who got into worldwide in the thirties, the forties, the fifties, who heard Armstrong on the radio back when he was real humble if you go back and read his stuff from back then, you'll just be like, this guy, this, this, you'll think you wrote it yourself, right? He was great, right? 
the people who got into that were willing to break from the mainstream churches. But then once you're in it, the the cycle repeats yeah. and they come up with more person worship and more uh you know codified doctrine halakha is what the hebrews call it catechism is what the catholics call it so he had his doctrines and they just were not they they can't deviate and and from the people we know a lot of people who were in that you do too right you know them and if you they talk about it it sounded like it was wonderful in the 60s and 70s could you imagine being somewhere for eight days with 15,000 yeah. people that believe like us? Be awesome. <laughs> Terry's like, I don't want to be around more than so your life. <laughs> right. Right. I, I mean, you, not, I mean, the yeah. number would be overwhelming, but it would be awesome to see that many believers in one group and area. And that was one site. Yeah. So that was, so they had one in Big Sandy. They had one in Tahoe. They had one in Australia, right? They had this many people everywhere. And so, so when it's that, and they even had um, sports, they had uh, intramural sports leagues. And I mean, they were the full Monty, right? They were the whole thing. And, and so now, you know, it, it disintegrated. Um, and if it disintegrated while you were still in it, you're going to be damaged goods for the rest of your life. You know, maybe, you know, it's possible. So. Yeah, but I wasn't in it. I we picked it up. Uh, we were with an independent group that are very, uh, that were very open to change. For a while, is that so? Worldwide is the similar. It's the break off of the Church of God, right? Worldwide was the big one, and everything broke off of that. Because I'm thinking, Eldon maybe came out of Worldwide, or was associated, or was part of it, or knew it, or something. Yeah. Eldon. Yeah. Oh, you mean the Church of God down there? No, I think they were part of Worldwide before they left. Probably. I know that uh, YRM was. Yeah. Because I've read those doctrines that I just told you about. Mm -hmm. I stood in YRM's old building and read a pamphlet. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. I think it's the it. same thing. They just put Yahweh. They just put Yahweh. Yeah, YRM. Yeah. yeah. But that was yeah, that was 15 years ago. Yeah. I, that was yeah. I don't know what they meant. Yeah. But no, that's it. I mean, when you go to a feast, if you have somebody at the feast who's been keeping it for more than 30 years, Probably they have some they have they have some some roots to worldwide. Yeah. Well, anybody else? Cuz I I mean, I give uh you know, I I like worldwide. I give I give credit. Because when we and this is another part about giving people respect. Uh, when I when I was MC at Wiboka, I would make sure that the elder in the room was the one who said the last prayer, like the the most the person who kept the most feasts, who's had the most wisdom, because the people who were in worldwide were the first people to deal with how do I keep my job and do the holy days, how do I work in the world and not eat pork? How these are the people who are the the Kind of the trailblazers and so we don't we don't have to recreate the wheel we could just go look at them and say how did you do this because they're our elders they did it before us and they're older than us right so we have to give them respect doesn't mean that you have to you know, continue to follow them like whatever it is saying but yeah they did um uh, they did a lot of good stuff uh and and we have the offshoots which is um United Church of God and Living Church of God were the first two big offshoots of it. And then there's Philadelphia and Church of the Great God. And, then, you know, there's a whole, they used to call them the ABCOGs because they all have COG plus another letter in their, in their name. Do you know why they're called the Church of God? Everett knows. No. Mm hmm well, I, that's the most common name used in the Bible, you know. Yeah, 12 times in the King James, the New Testament assembly is called the Church of God. Two or three times it's called the Church of Christ. Yeah, so they, that's makes perfect sense, right? Call it the Church of God. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, at any rate, thank you guys for listening to me ramble today. <laughs> <laughs>